Um, well, I, um, I'm, I'm an architect, and uh, I've learned so much today about how architects do things from listening to other people that I'm, I'm really glad I'm here. Okay. Well, I'm going to start with this image of Le Corbusier, um, who was, of course, one of the great architects of the 20th century and who was continuously in the habit of drawing. He, all, he made a drawing every day all his life. He always had a sketchbook in his pocket. Here he is drawing in his little cabin on, which was 12 feet by 12 feet. It's in the south of France, and he retired here every August to simply draw and think, and that's what he's doing there. Now, of course, we live in a different age, and much of our drawing is digital, and I'm the first to embrace that. Um, but I still say that in today's world, with all the digital means that we have at our disposal, the quickest way to develop an idea is still with some kind of writing instrument and a piece of paper, which is what he's doing here. Another key component to what he's doing here, you can't see, but it's a trash basket. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath the table, because that's how you go through drawings and thinking about things. Now, uh, one of the drawings he made from this old cabin on is, you see at the bottom, that's the view outside his window. It's of the Mediterranean. And the reason I put it up there is that, you know, technically speaking, it's not a great drawing. That's not the point. He was. He was attempting to draw what he saw, and perhaps in some way remember it, or even to understand it, all of which we've talked about today. So, as I tell my students, and I teach drawing, it's not about making a pretty drawing. I've been a drawer all my life. Uh, one of the things that I like to draw are barns because wherever I travel, I find that the best indicator of what's going on in a culture are the barns. You can learn so much from a barn, the way it's put on a hillside. You can tell what grows there. You can tell what sort of materials are available. And you can always tell that these buildings were made by a farmer, not by an architect, because they get directly to the point. <laughs> and usually, there's no architecture around it that's anywhere as good. So, uh, tobacco barns are big in North Carolina. That's our major crop. Texas, a lot of fences in Texas, which tells you, you know, there's cattle or horses. In North Carolina, there aren't many fences. That's because we mostly grow things. We don't have a lot of livestock, except for hogs. So, you know, uh, I just do this out of habit. A red barn with blue hydrangeas. I mean, how nice is that? <laughs> and these barns uh, have uh, remarkable qualities um, in the way that they're put on the land and the way they respond to the climate and to a piece of land. You can actually tell which way is north just by looking at these barns. Because I can tell you the farmer was very aware of that. When he built a porch, he wanted to build a porch that stayed dry. A little change of subject here, uh, Rembrandt, not out of place today. Um, you know, it's been said that Michelangelo and Leonardo were great draftsmen, but I'll put Rembrandt in that class any day. I love Rembrandt's drawings. I have, all, I have a copy of all of them. This is a little sketch he made of his wife. I'll bet you that sketch took five minutes. You know, done with a pen and a little ink wash. And, you know, in all my art history classes, people would say, well, these drawings by Rembrandt, they were like little studies for something he was going to incorporate in painting. And I don't doubt that some of them might have been. But in recent years, I've come to realize that what Rembrandt was doing was drawing as a way to understand the world. You know, he was really trying to understand the world. Someone mentioned a painting, you mentioned a painting that he did late in life. You know, Rembrandt, and Rembrandt's one of the few artists who made many paintings of himself, from youth to old age. And I think he made those paintings as a way to try to understand, as he made many of these sketches. And so I 
make sketches. Um, this is a dinner I had recently. Um, it's a fish dinner. Uh, down at this particular restaurant, it's, it's known as a herring and a piece of rock. Um, the rock is actually a rock fish. And the iced tea and of course the lemon pie. Now people do this all the time on Instagram, I know. <laughs> but, but taking the time to make this little sketch, which also take, took about three minutes, um, I, I discovered something about this place. You know, uh, you've mentioned that painting, you know, drawing is a, is a way of kind of understanding the scene. So what I came to learn about this, and this is the little restaurant, it's actually a shack on the Roanoke River in eastern North Carolina. And you can, you can, it's open only two months of a year in March and April. Why is that? Because in this river, there's this immense uh, migration of herring, or shad. Um, and it happens only two months of the year, and the fish are there in the millions. And so in addition to catching them, a few local folks would put up these little fishing shacks and uh, you know, fry the fish and sell them to people like me who come from 100 miles away just to celebrate the season of this herring run. But what I also learned by making a sketch is that the herring I had for dinner that night didn't come from this river, but it was totally fished out uh, by ships with foreign sounding names that harvest all the herring in the ocean and there's now a moratorium on fishing here. So from a little sketch, right, there's a lot that can be gathered. Three years ago, I started making a series of sketches uh, that you mentioned, it's, I call them native places. Um, and I, and I, what, what, I'm, what I started to do was to pair a sketch with 200 words or less. And the 200 words or less couldn't repeat what was in the sketch. And I found it was a really good discipline. So this is like sketching and language, if you will, as a way to understand the scene. So I continue to do these one, one every two weeks. And this is one that I did, for example, in uh, about the time that Hurricane Sandy came sweeping up the East Coast and flattened uh, Staten Island, put New York out of commission uh, for a week, and devastated Brooklyn. And I, so I made this little sketch of some cabins that are in North Carolina that have been there for 200 years. Well, you know, people in New York thought that they were invulnerable to weather, but people here in North Carolina have known uh, that you don't build on the ocean, you build behind the dunes, you don't build out in the open, you build underneath uh, live oak trees. So here are two kinds of drawing. Uh, this is a house I designed for uh, a place in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Uh, much of the buildings that I built on the coast of North Carolina have, have to deal with devastating hurricanes. Apart from the southernmost tip of Florida, North Carolina gets more hurricanes than any place on the east coast. So the sketch at the top is one about kind of scooping out the scene. It's the sunset from the piece of land where I was going to build. And my client loved that sunset. It was, you saw it out over Shim Creek. Uh, my client had also been devastated by a previous hurricane uh, four years earlier that had destroyed his house and his marriage. So the hurricanes were big on his mind. But nevertheless, he wanted a view out over Shim Creek so he could catch that sunset. And he wanted it to be safe in the event of 150 mile an hour winds. Well, you know, if you have, and so he wanted his windows 12 feet high, it was 12 feet. Uh, a 12 foot high window in a hurricane is, you know, not going to last. Also, a 12 foot high window facing west in a sunset in August in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina is an oven. So, I designed the house with this interesting little shade here. I'll show you it more in a minute. There's a window 12 feet high. The house goes to 18 feet high, has a little balcony, big hearth, little sketch of the hearth. So this one is about scoping out the scene, but this one is about trying out ideas, you know, testing um, ideas. 
And so uh, this is a key element of that house, is these folding screens. And there, uh, uh, there are 12 of them, and each one of them weighs 750 pounds. They're very simply made. This house costs $500,000. They're very simply made um, out of materials that are used to make uh, oil drilling rigs, you know, the graded platforms. Mm -hmm. So they come super galvanized that can resist the weather. So out here you see his beautiful view over Shem Creek. Uh, during much of the year, spring and fall, these things can be open and they form kind of a shading device. But uh, in the middle of summer, my client closes them so that he's shaded. And if there's a storm coming, he closes them so his windows are protected. Yet even when they're closed, you can see through and it makes this delightful pattern. And this is what they look like. Uh, one's open, the rest are closed. Each one is carefully balanced so that you can, uh, a child can raise it or lower it. Uh, here's, here's another drawing about a house in the, in the face of danger. This is in the Bahamas, also a big hurricane zone. And uh, interestingly enough, I made these sketches, I was at a conference on psychology, and uh, these mm -hmm. were, were interesting. Talent may defend against creativity. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, well, anyway, th this was a house on, uh, on an island in the Bahamas called Scotland Key, and the owners wanted this kind of eagle's nest of a house because that's where they'd get better views and better breeze and also it kept them away from the ground. The Bahamas, um, this particular island, Scotland Key, it's like paradise but it's paradise with an edge. Down on the ground are scorpions, adders, there's a particular tree there called a poisonwood tree which is like poison ivy to the power of tin, it's so virulent. Um, so, you know, it was going to be this house lifted up above that. So here, here's some more sketches trying things out. <coughs> and that's pretty much how it turned out. Um, it's interesting, you know, what's not included in the sketches that I later learned to do. You notice that all the openings are just openings. And the more I thought about this house, the more I realized every opening had to be protected because it was either glass or screen. And even if there were a 150 mile an hour wind, you'd want to close those things down, the house would be safe, uh, but it would all, you know, it would survive. And it did. You know, the year this house was finished, the worst hurricane, 150 mile an hour winds came to Scotland Key. Oops. Well, anyway, this is what our clients wanted. You know, they wanted this idyllic view and, um, if you understand the weather, um, this is a view looking uh, west over the Sea of Abaco. And you see that big storm out there? You can relax because the winds are blowing it away from you. They always blow the winds in from the Atlantic and over the Sea of Abaco. So here's some plans of the house. It's a four square, it's very simple. But I put these little sketches up to show, you know, here's a, uh, here's a tobacco barn in North Carolina, uniquely suited to its place. <coughs> Notice how important the roofs are. And in this particular house, because you can't uh, drill a well in the soil here, because if you do, you'll come to salt water, you, you collect all the rainwater from your roof. So I decided this roof would work better as a funnel. That's why it's kind of this inverted hip roof. And all the water comes down this central column to tanks which are here on the ground floor. Well, you know, this, this building didn't inspire this building, but the memory of it, the memory of a building with a, a roof that was so significant um, made me feel comfortable with that idea. 
a few years ago, a friend of mine said, uh, I, I was going to Louisiana, and a friend of mine said, you have to go to Oak Alley. And he said, the reason you have to go there is because of the shadows. This is another sketch that's about sort of understanding the scene. So I went to Oak Alley. He was right. The shadows are far more important than the, than the plantation house. They are extraordinary. These trees are 300 years old. They're older than the house. And the pattern of the Spanish moss, the foliage, the shadows, the dappled light, is phenomenal. So here's a sketch I made, right, just because I'm trying to capture the moment. Which, by the way, is, I think, why we all sketch. And also, by the way, the moment's all we have in life. But it'll show up, you know. Like four years later, I was asked to design a building that will protect um, young uh, plants called a lath house. L-A-T-H. Uh, a lath house is a botanical space where tender plants can survive. It has to have this very precise ratio of light to shade. And so here's my building. And what I like about this building is that you almost don't see it. From This is, this is how you approach the building. And it's a building of light and shadow. You know, it's a building. Right? And it's geometric. But look at the light and shadow of that Japanese maple or these flowers and plants in the foreground. Oop. And you know, um, I had made a sketch like this of a handle on a screen door. I mean, so just a little thing, right? But look at the variety. I call this a back porch Mondrian. <laughs> um, and by the way, these sketches, one of the reasons I can make these sketches is that I've discovered a watercolor brush with water in the handle. And so, uh, you know, literally a sketch can be done very quickly. They're not as sophisticated, but they're quick. So here's the lath house, and um, I positioned it because of those two big Norfolk pines there in the foreground. Uh, you know, I love doing buildings like this. This building cost $100,000. Wow. And it took two weeks to build. <laughs> but look at the quality it has. It's wow. like a gossamer veil. And it's made of very common things, two by twos. And notice the way it changes color according to the time of day. Right, like here. It's in full sun. Here the sun has been covered with, uh, you know, the, the sun is obscured and you start to see through it. And here it is um, just on its own. Um, two by twos, steel columns. The only thing to touch the ground are these steel columns. This veil comes up, wraps over, it goes down, and just kisses the ground, but doesn't touch it. Uh, here's some more drawings about just, you know, understanding where I am. Um, we used to go to Cozumel a lot, and we loved eating in this restaurant at the top. It has these big groupers swimming around in the, in the water, and, and this thatched roof. Um, which is, you know, just made of reeds, but look at that big overhang. Down below it is one of my favorite buildings in North Carolina. It's the Greensboro Cracked Diesel Engine Block Repair Company. Really specific. And it didn't have an architect. It was, you know, designed by the guy who fixed these cracked diesel blocks. So you can see that he wanted the whole thing to open up to face the south. So these are three big sliding doors, which he made himself. They all fold over here, right, to this one piece. And he figured, well, that's a pretty good place to put a light. So he takes the pole up and puts a street light there. Needs a little shade and keeps the rain out. So he just bends the roof down. It's made of tin. 
And over here, he's he's bought a door from Home Depot, you know, with three little windows like that to make his office. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. My, oh, there we go. So, uh, a few years, a few years ago, um, I I entered a competition to design the headquarters for the North Carolina AIA. That's the American Institute of Architects. Uh, every state has a headquarters building. In forty-nine states, the headquarter buildings are in renovated buildings. This was to be the first one built from the ground up. So uh, competition was held, and um, it was a really interesting site in downtown Raleigh. Uh, this side faced the state capitol. This side faced uh, Commercial Street. And the idea was to have one roof that related both. So it's like a piece of folded origami almost. This side faced south, so it's got a really big overhang. This side's on a commercial street, and our galleries for architecture inside. So I gave it its own little overhang, and then projecting out of that is a big stone wall. So it's a little conceptual sketch. It's in your gallery here. This is another drawing. So that's you know that's kind of trying to figure out an idea. Here's the competition drawing that we made, and it's more refined, um, but. You know, the judges said one of the reasons we won this competition, apart from the fact that we had a really good site plan, was that we obviously knew how to draw. How often do you hear that in the digital age? So uh, in this one, I made the drawing of the building. The landscape architect, Greg Bleem, made the drawing of the landscape, the trees. Um, Ashley Osborne in our office did the color rendering. And we were in three different cities at that time, you know, 800 miles apart. I love it that we could make a drawing like that. You know, everything is hand drawn, but it was scanned and put together. So it's pretty close to that sketch, right? Pretty close. It was very important, I thought, to have a building that belonged to North Carolina. I didn't want it to look like, you know, some aluminum clad building that could be anywhere. Uh, so the stone is from quarries in North Carolina. The wood is from the Great Dismal Swamp. The, tent, the, the metal roof is like the roof on a barn or the roof on a Baptist church. You know, it's got a lot of meaning It's a metal roof, but it's, very, it's a very North Carolina thing. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate as an architect to have designed both my own house and the office that I uh, worked in. So my office was actually up here. It didn't turn out that way. The competition brief called for a floor that could be rented out as part of the pro forma. So towards the end of the project, the um, AIA made me an offer I couldn't refuse. It went something like this. Frank, we can't afford to pay your fees. <laughs> Give you free rent. <laughs> so about that time, I paid off the mortgage on my existing office building, so it seemed a good idea. And I must say, it is a pleasure to drive into something every morning and re at where the architecture starts with the parking lot. I mean, it's a beautifully detailed parking lot. And here's that stone wall. Here's the wood from the Great Dismal Swamp. These are all North Carolina trees. We gather all the rainwater from the entire roof and it goes into this attention garden. And it's a, it uses a quarter of the energy that a normal code compliant building would use. Largely because it's got this big overhang. As you know, I've been studying overhangs for, for, for 35 years. <laughs> I'm making sketches of them. And uh, this photograph was made um, uh, in the middle of the summer, and you can see the entire wall is shaded for all that glasses. But in the winter, the sun comes into the house, into the building. Uh, Christmas a year ago, I was having lunch at this 
big house in Provence, a farmhouse. And you know, lunches in France can take a long time. And also, one tends to drink a great deal. So in, in an attempt to sort of clear my head, I went out and wandered around and I went into the farmer's barn and I found these plowshares, shares. And not just these, there, he had 36 different plows. Look at them, everyone's different. See, this one's got a little swivel on it. See, go back and forth. <laughs> this one obviously pushes things aside as you're plowing with it. This one's a real Sharpie here. I don't know what they're all for. They all hitch up to a mule. Um, and so I started thinking about these plowshares and where did they all come from? Well, if you look at, if you look at plows in this country, we're industrial. You know, one plow fits all. You know, and it's all about plowing the most in the quickest amount of time. Um, well, you know, all these plows are very different. So, as a result of plows, our landscapes look like this. Those Provencal plows are for landscapes like this. Because you see, here's the classic trilogy of, of agriculture in Provence. Grapes, olives, wheat. And from that, if you put it in a little fish, comes their diet. And so each of those plows was probably made, you know, for going between uh, the vines and the vineyard. Another plow was for plowing between the rows of wheat. Uh, another plow might be made for a steep hillside, like up here. And another plow might be made for the valley. So that kind of specificity um, is what I learned from making that little sketch. And by the way, trying to write about it in 200 words, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Sketch takes five minutes, 200 words can take three or four hours. Really. This is one I wrote called The Stupid House. Um, you know, we live in that age of smart houses, of course, and smart cars. Uh, I was trying to make an argument here for some things don't need to be so smart. Like these houses in Charleston, they're known as the Charleston Single, they're single one room deep. They tend to face south or southeast. <laughs> uh, you catch the prevailing breeze, can go right through the house. Because this wall is blank, all these porches or piazzas, as they call them, stay private. You actually enter the house through the porch. It's the most amazing thing. These are the outdoor living areas. And every room has windows on at least two sides and usually three sides. But an amazing house for um, And I wasn't even thinking about that. It just came naturally when I designed this Sunday school for a church in Charleston. This is for the circular church. It's the oldest church in Charleston, 1685. And it's always been a progressive church. They're in the center of Charleston. To give you an idea how progressive they are, in 1850, they brought uh, African Americans into their congregation. And another key to how progressive they are today in 19, uh, uh, 2016, the whole church has two parking places. I mean, that obviously doesn't mean anything to you. But, but in the South, form follows parking. You know, and you can't do a church without a lot of parking. These people are so courageous, they do their church without parking. Well, uh, you, the, this progressive church, they wanted to build a 21st century edition, and they wanted it to be totally sustainable. So out here in this little courtyard are uh, 12 geothermal wells. I told them the best way to do a building like this is to keep all your circulation outdoors because that's a third of the building. You don't have to use any fuel. Not realizing that it's the same principle in the Charleston Single. Um, and to use local materials. Here's some more of that. Cypress again, and steel, and stucco, 
And although it's a very modern building, the colors and the materials are very familiar in Charleston. And it makes a really delightful environment. Now, I can't say this comes from necessarily sketching buildings in Charleston, but uh, sort of an attitude towards design and observation does come from that. <coughs> so I continue to make these sketches um, and write about them. Uh, a few years ago, I was hiking in the Shenandoah Mountains. In this thick grove of trees, I came upon the cemetery and from the tombstones, I learned that it was the resting place of Lemuel Fox. And of course, when the cemetery was made during his lifetime, it was a cornfield. And Lemuel and his sons would pick up the stones from the cornfield and put this little square in place, and it would later become their resting place. I found that so touching because today, how many of us will uh, be buried in the place where we live. My son lives in London. Uh, he publishes a magazine. And recently I was sitting out uh, one afternoon, about this time of year, well in May actually, and uh, in a pub. And um, just across the way was another pub called the Blue Post. I made this little sketch. And you see that everybody standing outside the pub, it's like there's a fire drill, right? And it's a beautiful May afternoon. Everybody's standing out there, they're gesticulating, they're texting, they all got pints of bitter, some of them put it on the gravel curb. And so I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, in London, everybody gets paid on the last Friday of the month. You can see this was made on the last Friday of the month. <laughs> And what do you do when you get paid? You take your mates out for a pint. And because it's nice weather, everybody wants to sit outdoors. I thought that was so cool. So we left and walked down the street. Two blocks further, another pub was like that. I was staying in Surrey, so that night I drove home. It was a Friday night, end of May, beginning of June. I drove home about 20 miles to our place in Surrey, past one pub after another. And all these people standing out on the street. I thought, well, what a civilized city that is. And then I started to realize, why is that? Because in London, there is a tax that you pay every time you drive into the city. Seven pounds, about ten dollars. Ten dollars coming in, ten dollars to get out. It's automatic. As a result, not many people drive into London. As a result, the buses work. As a result, the taxis work. As a result, the air is clean. As a result, it's safe to stand outside on an evening having a pint with your friends. What you can learn from making a sketch. So to finish up, back with Rembrandt. I love these sketches. Notice that they're a little clumsy. You see the hands aren't quite right. That didn't matter. He was catching the moment. And I promise you this wasn't something for a painting. He was capturing the moment. And I want to end with this one, which is truly a grand painting. It's by uh, Diego Velasquez. It's Las Meninas. I'm sure you know it. Here's the princess. And she's surrounded by her attendants, two dwarves, one of whom is kicking the dog. And over here is Velasquez himself. And um, I put this quote down here, it's from V.S. Pritchett. He's an extraordinary writer. He was born in 1900, died in 1997. English writer, uneducated, never went to college. Grew up uh, in the leather trade in London, but learned languages, traveled, began to write, and is one of the most perceptive writers about painting that I know, even though he was not a painter. And in a little essay that he writes about the Spanish character, he's got this quote. This is what living is to the human animal. It is to look. To look is to be. And, and, and he's writing that about this painting. Notice how people are seeing in this painting. The 
Meninas are totally focused on the little princess. Uh, actually, this is a mirror with the king and queen. They're somewhere over here, and you're seeing them in a mirror. Here's a messenger about to arrive. And here's Velasquez. He's the only one who's looking at us. So this whole notion of looking as a way of being, I thought was so compelling, it would be a great place to end. Thank you. Mm -hmm.